Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the spring webinar series of the Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative. My name is Gwen White. I'm the science coordinator for the Tallgrass Prairie LCC. We've had a, a great run of speakers uh, through the spring and we'll continue for another couple weeks. If you've seen the email announcements for the webinar series, we've been able to add a couple of presentations to that going into the next couple of weeks. So. Um, please feel free to join us at this time each Wednesday for the, for the next couple of weeks and we'll continue to, to have speakers on, on hot topics for conservation in the Tallgrass Prairie. Um, today we have a speaker who will be talking about cover crop systems and benefits for wildlife and I'll let uh, Abby Donnelly, our webinar coordinator, introduce the speaker and uh, thank you for joining us. Hi, uh, this is Abby. Um, today we have R Ray Wright from the University of Missouri with the South Farm Research Center. Um, you can take it away, Ray. All right. Well, I uh, work here at the university and I've been involved with agriculture for several years, um, many, many years actually. Got my degree in fisheries and wildlife and my current position is has an opportunity where I can merge conservation and agriculture. I work at a lot of our farms and centers around around the state, and I'm about the only one that does the work with uh, conservation and agriculture, so it's kind of a, a new area for a lot of the, the ag producers. Um, I'll just go ahead and move on with this um, presentation. I uh, gave part of this presentation a few years ago. And it was developed in part because the National Wildlife Federation was interested in the role of cover crops and wildlife. And I was doing some research here and there, mostly unfunded. And they got they got word of it and I told them, I said, yeah, I'd like to do it, but I'm gonna need to have MDC, which is our Missouri Department of Conservation, uh, help out um, just just so we get enough funds to have a, a tech and, and everything. So. And as a result, we were able to look at some, a lot of things here that a lot of people haven't, haven't thought about much. Um, I'll go ahead and go through the presentation, and at the end, uh, we can uh, field any questions you want. So, expanding the role of cover crop systems while enhancing benefits, wildlife, and natural resources. I can tell you right now that there have been several conservation people that have talked to me on the side and they said they don't believe there's any role for conservation benefits in these cover crop systems. And I, I'm just completely against that. I think it's a huge opportunity and hopefully with this presentation I'll be able to uh, kind of give you some insight on my thoughts on it. So cover crops, quite honestly it's like everything else, depends on who you talk to, um, it, it's going to have a different definition. Mainly the cover crops used to be recognized for holding the soil. Just general soil improvements, um, keeping the erosion down. And in Missouri, that's a huge problem. Um, as the cover crop movement, if you will, has increased, definitions definitely changed quite a bit. And our farmers in this area are, are extremely excited about it. And it's, it's more than just planting a crop. They're, they're actually getting into the concept of the microbial activity of the soil. They're diving a lot deeper than I've ever seen agriculture producers dive in general into their farm management systems. And I don't know if it's money driven or probably, I'm sure it's money driven, but it's probably uh, a way to safeguard yourself against droughts which are coming, our weather patterns are changing changing, uh, we get heavy rains and then we get long periods of drought and our crops aren't designed yet to handle that. So that could be a big play in there, just kind of add a cushion. Uh, the popularity, this is, uh, Sarah, it's one of our uh, sustainable uh, agriculture research uh, and education portions of the university. They did a survey 2014 and 15 <coughs> on basically uh, the, uh, acreage uh, using cover crops. And you can see here the, uh, the uh, popularity of it's increasing. Now we'll say a lot of this data is based on 2014-15 because 
that's that was the only funding I got that was geared towards specific studies. I will add some other things in here because a lot of these little studies I have kept going on through um, internship programs, things where I get students for uh, little or no cost, and then they can just have a project. Uh, let's see. Okay. They also looked at this. This graph here is going to talk about a little bit about the uh, the changing trends in cover crops. That old definition of uh, soil erosion control that can be done with one species. Now, what's happening here is you can see in the percentages that the mix of four or more cover crop species over here. I'll quit using my finger because you can't see that, but you can see them. These these ratios are increasing quite a bit from two-way mixes, and they didn't have any surveys on one-way mix. But basically what this is telling me is what I'm seeing with the farmer buy into these programs and the, the soil health benefits, they're actually looking into it more and more because the greater these mixes, just like everything else, the more diversity we have in there, the better the system's going to be, uh, the more stable it's going to be. So that kind of backs that up. This slide, um, like I said, I gave this presentation um, for a different group, and I've modified it a little bit. But basically, this is something we all know, uh, The all conservation-oriented people know, is that a, a big chunk of conservation really needs to be on that private land for success. With, without the private land input, we're kind of sunk. I know in Missouri, because we don't have that much private land. Um, and what this slide is basically telling is we have a whole division here at the Missouri Department of Conservation that is dedicated to private lands. That was a huge shift up, but it was exactly what was needed and has been incredibly successful. And then Iowa, I'm just putting that in there. I had to go do a presentation in Iowa on cover crops, or I got to do that, and that was a, an eye-opening experience for me because they've got a lot more challenges than we do in Missouri. I, I look at conservation management, you know, in a traditional sense, there's just there's a few things that absolutely need to be there, and I've kind of summed them up to critical habitat, quality of habitat, where the habitat's positioned, multiple species management, species of concern, and cost benefit. These kind of concepts are, are what drive a lot of our decisions on what we're going to do, what's going to be funded for conservation. More species we get in there, the better off. If there's species of concern, that's better. Cost benefit, we need to be able to be accountable for our dollars that we're putting in. Uh, positioning, in, in Missouri, we've, we're, we're pretty wild in our, uh, our farm situations. We have a lot of small farms that have habitat, different habitats all the way around them. And we also have areas down in our southwest part of the state, you can have 6,000 acres of field uh, with very little habitat. So these are the basic principles of conservation management that we use for traditional conservation management and what I'm trying to apply in for uh, current management. So Missouri Department of Conservation, MDC, we're basically, we're pretty well known with our, how successful our conservation efforts have been here in Missouri. And in this graph, this kind of backs up the, the, the statement earlier, that our public lands for conservation amount to about 4% of our state. I've got different numbers depending on where I get them, but it's pretty close to that. <clears throat> so I look at our success that we've had here in Missouri with our conservation and, and how well known it is. And we, we've done this on 4% 4, 4 of the ground. It used to be just on conservation areas, which was 2%, and the CRP doubled that essentially. But I keep looking over here to this region at 68%, and that's the private farm ground. And I, if you think of the success we had here with focused efforts, if we could just get some efforts over here, I think our I think we would be tremendously successful. Historic conservation uh, in our area, we have these areas like this up here in the left, which is the uh, CP33 type programs, conservation reserve programs, where they pay farmers to not not farm these erodible, highly erodible areas close to waterways, and I published a study just recently on the yield loss that you get as you come closer to the edge of the trees and why it's more profitable mm -hmm. to put a 30-foot buffer in there to get you the field average. I'm trying to change the, 
concept of losing ground to whole field profitability for that farm component. Uh, our prairies, native prairies, we don't have a lot of them, but we are. We do have some areas that are very nice, and we have some virgin prairies in Missouri. Another form of management, old growth. More current with our, our CRP type programs, we have the, you know, taking the edge, edge feathering, brush piles, and it's helping out a lot of other types of species out here, from turkeys to meadowlark quail. Now this slide I threw in there just to kind of needle a lot of my buddies in the conservation department, uh, because quite often, almost always, conservation and agriculture they butt heads all the way, and uh, my friends with the conservation environmentalists. You know, we're all trained in a certain way of looking at the needs for wildlife. Um, our ag producers are trained for the needs of their business, and I, I can walk in both those shoes quite easily. And I think that's where that comment came earlier where people were saying uh, they didn't think there was any place for uh, conservation in these farm ground areas to recover crops. And Basically, I think we're going to miss out on a huge opportunity if we don't try to try. This is uh, over here, Iowa State. This is what a research farm would look at like from a research farm manager. He'd look at this and say, or she, and say, yep, this is what I like, finely mowed areas, no, no influence of trees, everything's blocked so you can do your studies without uh, statistical influences, and that's kind of an area that I work at and trying to implement uh, conservation on areas like that. Here's an area that I put my heart and soul in doing a study on a private ground and they decided they wanted to put an irrigation pond in. Uh, what they ended up doing after I did TSI and stump removal and made this into a nice demonstration area, we had a lot of quail in here. Um, I had a meeting with them in January, 1st of January that I was trying to set up for a month and I was out here uh, December 26th and I heard the dozers. So they were pushing all out and they were kind of being butt heads about it. Uh, they just didn't want to let me know what was going on. But that was in the name of agriculture. And then here's just a typical field you see in the wintertime around uh, Missouri. There's absolutely nothing out here for wildlife to use. Uh, yeah, this is where I go in to talk about the kind of the shock factor. I mean, shock Conservation and agriculture butt heads a lot. Um, one of the, I gave a presentation in Kansas for the Quail and Pheasants Forever group, and I believe I met Zach Eddy. When I saw this, I, I kind of I wanted to use his little quote here, because here we got a, a person that that is looking at cover crops 2014 as a as a potential for wildlife benefit, and there's the, and I remember a picture being sent, and I believe it was from Zach Eddy, asking people to rate this habitat. And what it was was a bean field, a picture you really couldn't identify the beans in, but you could identify the bare soil and everything else in there. And immediately I knew what it was, but a lot of people rated it, and some people caught it and said it was terrible because they thought it was a bean field, which it was. But if you looked at it, at what value it had there at the time, that was good seasonal habitat. So this brings us all, all that talking brings us up to why, or the study that we put together. And like I said, this is the Missouri Department of Conservation helped out with uh, supplying me an hourly worker. National Wildlife Federation helped out with supplying funds for travel and, and basically conducting research. And then University of Missouri, that was my job to, to get it done. Uh, we start out wag sheets. When we one of our bases we look at with conservation in Missouri is we pull out a wildlife habitat assessment guide, and that's a standardized form. I know you can't read this, but I put it up there just so you can see what it, what it looks like. Um, cropland community, this one happens to be uh, quail in field habitat, uh, the title, but each one of these categories here have their own wag sheet, and basically it's a scoring mechanism you look at the habitat, you make estimates of whether this is a quality to a certain level, and they have rankings on how you get to that quality, and it gives it a value, it assesses a value. Higher values, the better habitat uh, assessment. 
So, but the thing with these guides, they're, they're, they're set up for traditional conservation. So I had to modify, and that was, that was not something a person could do very easily um, for a study of this size. So I made some modifications, mainly in the infield quail habitats, what I created, but it was made up from other portions and then put a little ag component in there. I had to modify some of these other ones a little bit by basically taking values out because they didn't apply for cover crops. But this sheet is mimics what we would do here in Missouri if we're going to evaluate habitat. So I wanted to do that for uh, looking at cover crops. One of the things we looked at was a cage exclusion. If we have cover crops out there, is it something that wildlife's going to use? And let's look at deer. In, in the ag world, we don't like deer. Uh, they uh, they cost us too much damage. But if we're going to look at a farm that wants to have some agriculture components and conservation and deer hunting, deer hunting is big in Missouri. Let's look at the cover crops uh, and see what what kind of uh, usage they get. So basically, I went into areas where I planted cover crops and I put these wire cages up, these cage exclusions, and uh, replicated the test and. This is in an edge of a cover crop cornfield from, it was cover crop last year. Um, I planted the same species on the edge that would go out in the field. Um, cover crop beans, cover crop wheat, and then one of the things I've been doing is I'm planting cover crops in place of buffer strips along waterways, and I'm looking at them for their wildlife value. So I had had this one planted, and I, I'll call it a CP33 cover crop. And then I came back and reharvested to see what the growth would do. This, out of the study, is about the only one that came back significantly uh, different. It, it was, a, and and basically what I'm, what it gets to is when you have a cage blocking out the area, there is utilization of those plants outside the area around here because we take this uh, meter square, harvest it, weigh it, dry it, and then we come out here and take a meter square, harvest away and dry it. Um, we, every one, almost every one of these came back that there was, there was some sort of usage. Whether it's rabbits or deer, I'm not for sure. I will tell you that on other studies that I've done, um, non-funded type studies, I was amazed that when I put in a, a plant like buckwheat, how the rabbits would come in and clean that out. It got me thinking about if you wanted to divert wildlife from eating your beans, early beans, if rabbits are a problem, that buckwheat, they really, they, they, I couldn't get any data off those plots because the rabbits selected those plots and cleaned them out. Same with winter barley. The deer came in and chewed my winter barley down and kept it down. I had, oh, I think 16 different species in here and those are two of them that I could not get any data off because wildlife was using them. That might be a good diversion crop in the future. Um, they might like that way better than beans or small corn. We followed up with summer call counts, and I was traveling quite a bit of the state. Brett Farm is up in central. Uh, I am stationed at Bradford Farms a lot of times. So I have done several years of call counts, and that's why I included that. I did not take habitat assessment guide data on Bradford because it's a research farm, and I've got to work with researchers. So I, that data came from uh, actual farms that were looking at just cover crops. Associated Electric is a small area that just started, and they are putting in a, a model farm using cover crops, so I was able to work on that. This Bee County Farm is a farm down the road from us, uh, Boone County Farm. It's just your typical farm. It's got an edge. It's got what you'd expect to see, and it's farmed traditional ways. So, and then the seat is a conservation area up north, north central Missouri. But basically, with these call counts, is we can look at the the number of birds we got in the summer. And I, I do know this is subject and subjective, and fall is a better time. I do fall call counts as well. But you can see here at the Brit Farm, associated with cover crops, WAG scores, 63 and 67 averages, uh, 2.4 birds. We go over here to the Boone County Farm, stark difference, hardly any birds calling, 
and the WAG score was terrible. Um, we come over here to SEAT, which is a conservation area, and 0.83 birds is what that says. WAG score is similar to, to Brit Farm. Cover crops are in there quite a bit. I, I will say that on the WAG scores, I mentioned that I, I do the infield habitat, and that weighed a lot heavier in the ratings than the other ones did, the other habitats. They were part of it, but the value, let me see if I can, the value of the total amount was 100 points, 100 points versus 51, 20. So they're weighted differently in there. I did need to make that point. And that's part of the reason these scores are as they are. Um, one of the things we've been doing kind of for the fun, I was talking about cover crops, and one of my friends with the conservation department, he said, well, yeah, all right, so say we get quail to start using the cover crop area. Are we just bringing them to their doom with the farm equipment and everything? And he really got me thinking about this, so I chatted with him a little more about how would we go about testing this. And he talked about a trampling study they did with grouse, prairie chickens, pardon me, prairie chickens. And they put clay pigeons out in the fields, and then they'd set, you know, a certain number of cows on there a certain number of days, and they'd go out and measure the uh, amount of broken clay pigeons, and that would indicate nest damage. So I've been doing this for several years. Um, I tied in with Columbia College. The students need an internship program to graduate. I need workers, and students procrastinate so much that I always had people coming in looking for an internship. So I'd have them conduct a nesting study. And then I'd also have them do lab work, lab class, teach classes out there, putting nests out and stuff, kind of a mapping studies, you know, teach students a little bit more about conservation and science instead of just the theoretical. What we found out, and I've, I'm in the process of trying to get this written up to send out for publication. When we plant, when we put nests in fields with, with beans, soybeans, and that's a cover crop field, our damage is pretty high. Our unbroken is about 15%. So in that area with, with soybeans, and that's a 15-inch planter, after it's been sprayed and everything else, about 15% of those nests make it. And that's over three or four years of data. We go into corn, and if we look at corn, that bumps up to about 30% of unbroken. Now, I, I look at this as even, even at 15%, if you consider that huge amount of Missouri that is in farm ground, and if we could get a piece of that and have a 15% success rate with quail nesting in there, I think that would be huge for us. I think that would really help out our ground nesting birds. And even as they we're, we're taking the data finding those clay pigeons, we're seeing nests being built in the structure above, also in the ground. So I, we didn't see any quail nest in, in, the, in the plots, but we had other birds nesting in there. And then this is a clay pigeon. I would um, I would paint them camouflage, and then send the students out with a mapping uh, portion of their class, and they'd have to set them, and then they'd have to come back out later on and, and find them. And camouflage clay pigeons in cover crop thatch is amazing. They would spend hours and hours and hours, and basically it taught them that you got to make good maps. And then even at that, it, it doesn't work so well. Um, so I, I, for some sick reason, I get enjoyment out of this, maybe because I had to do that kind of stuff when I was younger. But basically, I think we have a lot of room for success. And I, I'm, we're not even looking at, um, we're just looking at our corn and bean rotation. There's a lot more going on in Missouri than that. Um, what else do I want to say on this one? Oh, yeah, yeah. I haven't read this, but I was told that that 30%, success rate is very similar to what quail have in natural settings. Well, if that's the case, I think this door is wide open on where we should be moving with conservation. Um, insect usage. Now, 
this gets sticky because I have several different farms and we're looking at different different types of management. Like I said, the sweet seat farm that's up northwest Missouri, you've got a location difference. And also when you look at these all of these orders, they, they really it gives you a general idea of what's going on out there with insects. There are good insects and bad insects within these orders to identify and and really work work that in statistically, that would turn into a huge project. So during these next couple of slides, what I want you to do is just kind of look at them as as total numbers, as, as how many, you know, you look up there, are there a lot of different species? Once again, the more diverse it is, the better off we're going to be. When you look at good and bad insects um, in the ag world, one of the reasons they become a problem is because there's no balance in there. When you have a, a, a insect species that comes in and say the army worm comes in and just starts wiping out your crops, the reason it's doing so well is because there's nothing out there to keep it in check. So if you had the army worms coming out and you had other type of predators on army worms, those losses would still be there but not near what you see when you get a big monoculture of a crop. So I'm really pushing this information um, as uh, basically looking at the numbers and how many we got. I'll go over these slides pretty quickly. Um, Milo planted 15 inch row and 30 inch rows. You can see here that there's really not a lot going on as far as insects and these are just one time sweeps out in the field each month and then, then I would get an average on it. Um, you know, one thing about corn is there's insecticides on it. Milo is the same way. Uh, in this agriculture setting, that plays a pretty big role. And I, I made that assumption that that, that that was what kept these numbers down. This brome grass is actually a waterway between the two fields. It's a pretty neat little study set up. And you can see immediately the, the numbers. What I, I was kind of surprised because it was a solid stand of brome the numbers really, really spiked up. Um, that tells me that we have a buffer right here, a refuge of insects that could utilize this area, but there's something keeping them out of these areas. And and quite similar uh, on both of them, really. So there's, there's something, something going on, and I imagine that has to do with insecticides. Right next to it, though, in between, we seem to have pretty decent numbers in, in a monoculture. That, that was pretty impressive. After the uh, cover crops terminated, we went up to the Brit farm, which is uh, he's a younger guy who uh, wanted to start working with cover crops. And terminated the cover crops. There's no vegetation there. It's just dead debris, basically a nesting type situation. You can see our numbers are, are, are pretty low. I will say that the Brit farm, where these guys might have a heck of a cover crop stand or a poor one, the Brit farm got theirs in a little bit late and it was definitely poor. I can't remember these fields in particular. Uh, no insecticide. This would be the associated electric property, the demo farm. The numbers are up a little bit higher, uh, total numbers in the suites. And that's, that's, a, that's a good good sign. All beans, I didn't have any corn at that time. Like I said, it was just, it was a field that they were just setting up for demonstration. They didn't have split up in the corn and, and beans. They're, they're not ag producers up there. They just wanted to have a, a ag component, I think, as far as buy-in for their neighborhood. Um, so, but anyhow, the numbers were, were quite a bit higher than what we saw, by my mouth, quite a bit higher than what we saw in the other traditional type ag fields. And then less intensive ag, this waterway study, this was actually on Bradford farms in uh, areas where these were planted with the cover crops. Notice the numbers pretty well start to, to spike up. We do have swings on two-week intervals. That is really kind of one of the problems with sweet nets. If you're not out there every week taking 
collections, these populations skyrocket and crash in a heartbeat. Uh, we were, we, since this was on Bradford, an area close to where I, where I'm at, we've been able to do that, and that that basically documents the swings. But the numbers you can see are are really, uh, really pretty impressive. We have a a study that was going on looking at ecotypes of native plants, and I've incorporated that into here as well. And basically, you can see that there's a lot of insects on these native plants. Those are pretty good stands. This is a would be a CP33 conservation program 33. I have 10 different flowering plants in there with three different ecotypes: Missouri, uh, surrounding states, and then states surrounding those. Basically, a bullseye. And we've we've taken a lot of sweeps on that. And really, the uh, the key with this is, yeah. If you have a refuge with a real nice stand of native plants, I think you'll have the insect population ready to dive into those fields when the opportunity knocks. Uh, let's see. I stole this slide from Lisa Potter, I believe. And basically, it just sums up what I talked about. I, As I get to the end of this talk, I want to – I like to work – in things that, that I, I'm quite comfortable, com, comfortable will be successful. One of our big problems with cover crops around here is we're trying to cram another crop into a system that was designed, the corn and beans, designed not to have enough growing time uh, for other crops. So it's a challenge, and as, as the farmers maintain interest, interest in this, they're going to start looking at shorter season crops probably. And we're also going to be looking at, at cultivars of these cover crop species to get them to really grow and do their stuff as quick as possible. Since there's money behind it, I think that'll happen. But for now, wheat, I think, is our best bet in this region. Some people double crop wheat. And in central Missouri, I'd say about one in every five years it's profitable. If you get down to Boot Hill in the southwest, it's probably you probably profit more often. Um, because you've got about two more weeks growing season. But one of our big advantages here is after we plant our wheat, a lot of times they leave the field fallow. Now, leaving it fallow, you either are going to have to mow it to keep the noxious weeds down, chemical it, or disc it in. Any, any way we look at it, that's not good for wildlife in my opinion. I plant these five-way mixes of flowering plants to attract the insects into them. I plant sunflowers for birds, and I plant these over the summer, and this is what they look like over the wintertime. So if you think about some of the pictures I've showed you, there's not going to be any habitat for wildlife here at all. But you go over here to where there's a, a, a good stand of cover crops still standing, that will benefit wildlife. Now, wheat in Missouri is our third crop. As far as, you know, we're corn and beans and they plant wheat because they have to do the government program. But as cover crops develop and people start looking more at the soil health component, they are going to find out that the only way to get your soil health back to par, back to where it can handle these droughts and the rain, is adding other crops, not just corn and beans. So if they start looking at wheat, if they start looking at running cattle, Anything they do different than corn beans, corn beans, you're going to increase the soil health. This is an area I think we can really jump in with funding from states to plant in cover crops after wheat. And then you would have this type of habitat, food, shelter, uh, wildlife protection. All those critical habitats I pointed out will be enhanced with, with a plot like this. Um, I can just, as I finish up this presentation, I will tell you that when we have ice storms out here at the farm that mainly looks like this, I have birds circling over here. And what's happening is the bigger birds are landing on these, trying to get seeds, knocking seed down. And if you know uh, what happens during ice storms and, and upland birds, um, it, it's harsh on them. This is an opportunity to keep them alive until that ice melts off. I think that's it. Yep. I guess we can take questions. So um, I'll ask a question. This is Meredith Cornett. I'm with I'm with the Nature Conservancy in Minnesota, and I, I typed it into the chat as well. 
Um, but I'm really interested in um, what's going on below the ground in addition to the insect usage and bird usage. And I am curious about um, where I could learn more about the use of cover crops in restoring agricultural fields to prairie. You mean the conversion? What you're what you're looking at is the conversion of ag fields into uh, native prairie type stuff. Right, right. Reconstruction. Yeah, that that is a topic I hear a lot about. I have not seen any studies on that yet. We we were trying to put something together a while back, and funding got dropped on. And, what what's your main goal there is to to get this this uh native seed growing underneath a cover crop to suppress weed pressures uh mm -hmm. that can choke it out and i i know people are doing it but i really can't give you much insight on other than i think it's a good idea and a good opportunity for us to plant in cover crops i uh, or uh, natives i have a study going on right now where i'm planting in natives after wheat or during mm -hmm. wheat um, to get them to grow later in the summer. Uh huh. One of the problems I'm running into, it, it seemed like a good idea when, when we put this together. We go in and after we broadcast our fertilizer in, in the spring, I'd come in and I'd put a, a mix of some natives and some cultivars that were cover crops and get them to grow in the wheat. And once the wheat's harvested, uh, would provide enough pr protection from the sun to have the stuff that's already growing take off. Yeah. The downfall, I didn't think about this, I can't put chemical on it. Oh, right. So, I, because I'd kill everything out. And we've got some nuisance weeds that need to be hit early. So, one of the things I'm doing this year is I'm staging my fertility. I'm dropping fertility way back until the very last day that I think is possible. That way those natives can actually take off and not have any competition from those nuisance weeds. Uh-huh. Uh, but it, it doesn't exactly address what you're doing, but it's, it's one of those challenges that, yeah, it seems like a good idea, but when you put it right down in the field, all of a sudden you get thrown curveballs. Yeah, well, you, just, just what you said is, is helpful. Um, I've been trying to find some good examples out there and it, they're hard to come by, so that's that's great. Thank you. I know there's a lot of interest in it. I think uh, there's going to be some studies in the future on it, but um, it should, you know, like all this stuff, you, if you don't have a boss that says, yeah, go ahead and try that, right. you've got to find funding sources. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Hello. It, Ray, this is Jared Brook. I'm an extension wildlife specialist up here at Purdue University. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your talk and everything. And, uh, one of the, I got a couple questions for you. The first question is, ballpark figure, what, I mean, what percentage would you say are of the cover crops that are used in Missouri are the warm season cover crops? You know, so following wheat or following corn silage. Well, it, it's very small. Um, we, most of our farmers are stuck in the mindset of corn and beans. So, the, like I said in the talk that Wheat is one of those crops that you just have to have in your rotation to be part of the, the, the government program. And so it's not a high profit crop. So they really try not to plant it. They try not, don't put much fertility on it. Um, so it, those, those are really a minute part. But I think that if we could come in with some sort of incentive to plant these cover crops, and in Missouri, our DNR has gotten cover crop incentive, but if we can start focusing in on wheat after harvest, that gives you a tremendous amount of growing days to get these crops up and going. So, uh, and I, you, you're out of Purdue, you say? Yes, yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm really not too familiar with the agriculture there, but I bet you corn and beans would be the mainstay. Oh, yeah, it is, and, and wheat. Do you, do you have wheat? Yeah. We do, we we have wheat probably more um, in the southern you know wheat bean rotation more in the southern part of the state in the northern part of the state if it if they if wheat's planted usually it's planted in left fallow fallow um, but I think especially around dairy op operations corn silage is another opportunity uh, right. for a lot of the right. warm season mixtures 
Yeah, I think any one of these opportunities that we see that if we can start start seeing this kind of success, I think that's where we're going to we're going to be building. Um, yeah. As the farmers start seeing that, and if they're truly interested in soil health, that's I think we can document this pretty good that you're going to need to have different rotations. And this is just another crop going in. Yeah. And then my my second question was about your uh, clay pigeon study and and. When, when is typically the uh, timing of termination for cover crops there in Missouri? Because I know it's, it seems like it would it would more than likely be prior to to when quail are really nested heavy, you know, prior to May or June. So I think that might also factor into that in that uh, terminations happen prior to the peak nesting, which would mean you know that equi termination and planting. So that would mean, you know, that thatch and that, and that cover is still there um, when, when a peak nesting is. Yeah. Um, so the termination date, I guess one of the things we've we got we to gotta know that, that the cover crop systems are new. Um, insurance companies pick certain dates for termination. They have uh, changed their dates quite a bit lately. Um, we're, all, we're all learning. If we terminate our cover crops too early, they don't. There's a soil health benefits that, that are not realized. So what we're pushing, uh, at least some of us here, are get those cover crops terminated later. If you can hold off two weeks of termination, that's two more weeks of habitat. If you ask me, um, with that. What we've been doing is we take no-till planters, and we will take the cultures off and plant into standing live cover crops. So we have four-foot-tall vegetation that we're going in planting, and we're getting some pretty decent stands, beans especially. Corn, it's a little sketchy at times because of the seed soil contact, but we're overcoming that by modifying our equipment. Planting with a 15-inch row planter or a 30-inch row planter, you, both our cover crops and our cash crop, you can actually put these rows in there, and it's not near as bad as you think because you're actually going into bare soil if you go this, you know, six inches over from your cover crop row. So that's how we've been addressing it. If you come in and spray early like uh, some of the farmers are, you're probably not going to realize any, any real benefit. But holding off a little bit, I think that'll be a, a huge opportunity. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, Ray. Um, and if, if somebody wants to get a hold of me, you know, with questions, we've been doing this for, oh, probably five years. Uh, my boss says he was doing cover crops when cover crops wasn't cool back in the 80s. Uh, that's what he got his degree in. So cumulatively, I think we could probably get a lot of your answers for you. So just don't hesitate to send me an email, and I'll try my best to help you out. And Ray's uh, contact information is listed on our website, easterntallgrasslcc.org. Uh, um, but thank you so much, Ray, for your presentation. Uh, I'm so glad that we have enough interest in these webinars to continue um, further into April. If anyone would like to present uh, to our webinar audience, please contact me, Abby Donnelly, at Abby, Donnelly, Abby underscore Donnelly, F WS.gov, which is also listed on our website. Next week, we have Nancy North. She is both with uh, New Ground and the Fishers and Farmers Partnership for the Upper Mississippi River Basin. Her webinar is titled Watershed Leaders Network, Skills and Connection for Farming Neighbors, Ag Landowners, and Local Watershed Project Coordinators in Agricultural Watersheds. She'll discuss the Watershed Leaders Network, how it started, what, and what they're working on now. When, that's uh, next Wednesday, April 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the announcement is, uh, is not posted on our website, but it should be up soon, along with all the past recordings and contact information of all the other webinars we've done. Thank you so much for joining us this week, and we'll send you um, out another reminder for next week's webinar, and we'll see you then.